Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the third meeting of 2021 of the Economy and Fair Work Committee. I again welcome Maggie Chapman, who is joining us this morning. Although, although not a member of the committee, um, she'll be attending for the evidence session. Um, our first item of business is a decision to take items three and four in private. Do members agree to take those in private? Yes. Thank you. Um, so our second item of business this morning is an evidence session on employment and skills for recovery. I thank you all for joining us today and I welcome Chris Brodie, Director of Regional Skills Planning and Sector Development, and Lisa Petone, uh, Service Development Manager, Skills Development Scotland. Uh, Nora Senior, who is the Chair of Enterprise and Skills Strategic Board, and Mary Spowage, who is Director of the Fraser of Allender Institute. And thank you all for joining us this morning. Today's evidence session will enable the committee to consider issues around business recovery with a focus on employment and skills. The evidence today will inform the committee's input to the Scottish Government's budget for 2023. Um, I would like to start the questioning. And I, can I refer, first of all, to the paper that we had from um, Skills Development Scotland? Um, in the paper, it says that job-related training in Scotland has declined steadily over the last 15 years, which is reflected in the Scotland's Future Skills Action Plan, also uh, makes this comment. Can um, maybe Skills Development Scotland talk about the reasons why that has happened, um, where the responsibility for that decline lies? And I'll ask, sorry, I'll ask Chris to come in. Um, you're quite right that actually the levels of in-job training uh, undertaken by employers over the last 15 years has uh, fallen. Um, there are a number of reasons for that. Um, that that's primarily uh, a responsibility for employers in relation to upskilling uh, their existing workforce. Um, what I would say is that over the last uh, three, four years, uh, we have been talking about the critical importance of uh, training in the workforce as uh, an important part of both businesses' training strategies, but also uh, Scotland's skills strategy. Uh, it's clear, uh, and the pandemic has, has made this very clear, that the labour market is going to uh, continue to change at uh, a very fast rate. And as a result, um, people are likely to face uh, multiple uh, career uh, changes uh, throughout their working lives. So that increased focus on creating the conditions where employers can invest in employees, but also uh, where training is available uh, for individuals to upskill is going to be really important. I mean, the paper we have from Skills Development Scotland does set out a number of strategies and action plans. It's just, you know, can I have confidence that this is going to make the changes that are required? When we've seen a steady decline over that period of time, um, how can that decline be reversed? Is there, for example, enough um, incentives in there for businesses and employers? Is there enough infrastructure there to support them in retraining and reskilling and offering on these opportunities to their workforce? So I think there are um, three dimensions to that, and I'll allow uh, colleagues to come in in a second as well. I can see Lisa and Nora are looking to, uh, looking to speak. I think that the first is recognising that um, the primary responsibility uh, for training uh, employees lies with employers and it's really important that employers recognize the value of that investment uh, to support uh, their own growth i think secondly um, there's there are lots of terrific examples of our college and university system uh, flexing to provide uh, opportunities for uh, in work training uh, particularly in the college sector i think that's been one of the, the hallmarks of work pre-pandemic and indeed during the pandemic and the third, uh, as you, you rightly uh, say, convener, is, is the, the availability of training opportunities uh, and upskilling opportunities. And over the last uh, four or five years, we've seen the introduction of the Flexible Workforce Development Fund, which allows uh, employers who pay the apprenticeship levy to, to, to reuse some of that resource uh, to upskill employers. We've seen um, the adoption of a, 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 a transition training fund, firstly, uh, in the uh, northeastern relation to the downturn in oil and gas uh, a number of years ago. That's now been uh, mainstreamed and the Scottish Government has invested significant resources in transition training, which will allow people to 
uh, switch careers. Uh, also important to recognise that the apprenticeship programme in Scotland um, is used significantly by uh, employers to upskill existing employees. Thank you. And I think, did Nora Senior want to comment on this? Yes, thank you. Uh, it was really just to add, um, from an employer's point of view, um, businesses in Scotland have traditionally been um, worse investing in training than international competitors. And that has been that's gone on much longer than than the fifteen years that you've um, registered there. I think that where we have continued to invest is in practical skills um, for employees, where we haven't, uh, and where the the fall um, is is happening is around the upskilling and reskilling, as Chris has mentioned, but also in. Um, leadership skills where we've fallen behind either because businesses um, don't or haven't recognised the need to enhance management and leadership skills as their businesses grow, um, or that they are they don't have the um, the knowledge or resources in perhaps digital skills that is right for their business. So those are areas that um, we need to encourage business to uh, be, in, invest more in their uh, their human capital and their people, um, and we need to be able to uh, incentivise business and give them the opportunity to be able to recognise the benefits of um, the type of training that that uh, would empower their workforce. Thank you. And just finally, um, if I maybe go back to Chris. Um, during the past 18 months that we've had, we, I did have a conversation recently with um, Open University who said there had been an uptake in their courses, that they've been quite encouraged by individuals looking to retrain and reskill. Have you identified these kind of... Because I suppose what you're talking about is businesses' a reluctance or a, a lack of recognition of the importance there to invest. Um, and I did ask about if the infrastructure around them is enough to support them. But is there also a cultural issue in Scotland around devaluing adult learning and lifelong learning? Have we lost that? I think it was, a, from my memory, it was a driving force of the original parliament when we first established. And that seems to have slipped over the, over the existence of the, the life term of the parliament. I, I think the, the importance of whether it's called upskilling, reskilling, whether it's called lifelong learning, I think has never gone away. Um, I think what we've all recognised um, across the skills system over the last five years is that that needs a really strong and renewed focus. Uh, the pandemic has you know, caused huge challenges in the labour market and exacerbated some of the um, some of the trends that were underway prior to the recession. You know, the retail sector has shrunk uh, considerably in a, uh, a short period of time and, and may not recover to where it was before. Um, so uh, I think it's really important that we um, ask ourselves the question of the, the £1.8 billion pounds that we invest in post-16 uh, education, and that's not including what employers invest. How much of that should we be focusing on upskilling and reskilling? Um, and it's not to say that um, we have um, got it wrong in the past, but it's about recognising that the challenges that we're facing now and the challenges that we're going to be facing over the next you know, five, ten years are significantly different. Um, so we need to ensure that we're constantly calibrating where we invest. And I think you know, investment in upskilling and reskilling is going to be a, a dominant feature of, of the conversation in the skills system over the next five years. Um, thank you very much. I'll now invite uh, Gordon MacDonald to come in. Thank you very much, Convener. Uh, and I apologise if my link breaks up. I've been having problems this morning. Um, just on the point that we'll be speaking about, about the Scottish Employer Skills Survey, um, looking at the numbers, it suggests that uh, between 2011 and 2017, the number of employers who have been providing um, training to their staff over the previous 12 months moved from 73% to 71%. We then had a major drop in 2020 to 59%. So my, my, my initial question would probably be along the lines of, was it COVID-19 that has created that blip in training? Uh, and if it wasn't COVID-19, what was it? Because 
you know, we've consistently over a long number of surveys saw the number of uh, remaining bouncing round about the seventy percent mark. As I say, it's dropped substantially in twenty twenty, and I wonder if there's any underlying reason for it. Uh, if it's COVID, or is there another reason that would be causing that? And uh, maybe ask Mary Spouge since she's not come in yet. Hi. Um, yeah, I mean, it does appear to be um, to link, be linked to COVID and a lot of businesses pivoting to looking to kind of survive. Although also, you know, some of the data is quite interesting because obviously um, employees and employers have had to adapt um, their businesses um, in order to, you know, um, to meet the needs of customers in a different way, perhaps through the period of the pandemic. Um, and you know that that may well have included the adoption of of new skills, um, sort of on the job, um, just maybe not in a sort of formal um, training environment. And the, the employer skill survey is is really interesting as well because it tells us a bit more about the types of skills that um, employers feel that are are not necessarily being fulfilled by the the people that are applying for the roles. Um, and although, like some of the skills are obviously technical or operational or, or um, you know, relevant for the job specifically, um, a huge amount of the issues seem to be on kind of more um, softer skills. Um, you know, being able to to manage projects or manage your own time or you know these sorts of things. So, I mean, it's certainly um, a question for for all of us all, all in the skills system about how we ensure that. Well, particularly thinking about young people coming into the labour market. Have these these more rounded set of skills as well as you know perhaps the qualifications or the technical skills that they need. And uh, looking at that same document, um, it says that the reasons for not providing training to staff, uh -huh. the employers said all staff are fully proficient, no need for training, and twenty two percent said COVID nineteen meant planning plan training did not happen. So this drop off that the can be a temporary blip for seeing um, Chris like a comment and then maybe Nora. Certainly I would agree with um Mary's uh, comment there. I think what we saw in twenty twenty was a significant drop in uh, all sorts of activity and online training activity in business. One would I hope and expect that that would be uh, recovered as the economy uh, begins to open up. Um, whether that pickup is consistent across all sectors, I think, is a, a big question. Um, I think what we also need to be considering is about how we uh, invest behind opportunities that we're uh, seeing uh, in the, the recovery period as well. So, you know, we expect to see the continuing growth. Um, in the demand for uh, digital skills uh, in the economy, as Nora uh, referenced, um, we expect that the transition to net zero is going to be a big driver of the demand for skills as well. So, um, as with all um, kind of big economic labour market shocks, uh, what will follow will not be exactly the same as what we saw uh, prior to prior to the pandemic. I would just add to that that I think that the the drop off is partly because. Um, in a wonder, business had to shift to an online um, mode of working, which meant that any investment was really going to be made in digital technology and enabling people to remain connected both between themselves and with customers and clients. So I think that's where most of the investment went. Um, I think what Chris said, it would be different across different sectors. Those that are, were able to continue training online or digital skills, I would, as I'm, I, I, knowing from um, the business environment, I would say that there has been probably a, a greater emphasis on those type of skills related to communication. Um, there will be a fall off in practical skills because people simply haven't been able to gain access to the workplace. Um, and I think that that will come back again. It might be useful, Lisa, if you perhaps added um, some points just around the the types of training and uh, the the meta skills area. Sure, happy to add some remarks. And I think just to to follow on from what Mary was saying, we are seeing a marked change in the skills that employers are looking for, really in response to the COVID pandemic, but also. 
um, in response to Industry 4.0 and the advent and the emergence of new and emerging technologies. Employers are looking away uh, to some extent from traditional qualifications towards meta skills and the kind of adaptive expertise that kind of cuts across every occupational area. Um, and that's been seen not only in Scotland, but in the UK and internationally. And they're they're really saying that they value meta skills like teamwork, problem solving, communication, creativity, um, I, I, and I think these kind of these wiser bundles of capabilities and behaviours are the ones that we need to be prioritising within the education and skills system, and also preparing young people for jobs of the future. Um, you know, to, to have those kind of skills alongside the higher level skills that. Um, we also know that we need to put it for the digital era, um, and I think, yes, I think that's really critical um, both for young people entering the labour market, but also for adults um, as they move through the labour market and as as industries and um, occupations emerge and and change. Because what we're seeing is, um, you know, hybrid roles, adjacent occupations. And we're going. To, individuals are going to be able to. All individuals are going to have to be able to have a, a, a level of flexibility, and to be able to to recognise that the skills that they have at their disposal that they can use across these different contexts that they find themselves in. So I think with the upskilling piece, just to say, it's really interesting that you know in that report they say that everyone is very very proficient, but I think what we're seeing overall in in the, in the literature is. That we need to develop a kind of a new mindset towards upskilling and reskilling that does um, increase the importance on us all learning through life. So, my final question is: um, you know, you've highlighted that a lot of businesses had to move online to survive, and we already knew that in Scotland, the UK, and the EU, there were already 150,000 IT job vacancies. That have existed for a long number of years, but has there been any other impact of COVID on the uh, labour market that we haven't touched upon yet? Mary, you want to come in on that? <clears throat> I think to a certain extent, we we still don't know what the overall impacts will be on the labour market um, from COVID. Um, you know, with the furlough scheme coming to an end at the end of this month. Um, there's obviously going to be, you know, a sizable proportion of people who who were, are still being on furlough throughout the summer, who will then potentially be released. So it might be, maybe, that some of the shortages we're seeing um, in the hospitality industry could be kind of sorted out by that correction of of some labour being released. But we don't, we just don't know um, yet. And I suspect that some of the the wider structural challenges in our labour market in terms of supply of labour efficient skills or the right skills for, for posts or just overall supply in general, um, you know, are still going to be challenges. So, you know, the demographic issues that we have in Scotland, the outlook for the working age population, perhaps the interruption to what would have been more normal migration flows because of um, the UK's exit from the EU. Um, all of these things are still to play out um, in, in our labour market as it kind of adjusts to the, the post pandemic new normal that we're all we're all waiting for. So yeah, I, I just don't think we quite know yet what the impact will be, but particularly in certain parts of Scotland there are huge challenges around supply of labour and also supply of labour with the, the right skills for the roles. Okay, thanks. Does anybody else want to come in on that? Uh, I was proposing we move to Jamie Halcrow Johnson as Jamie has some questions that link to the discussion that was just happening with Mary. So I'll hand over to Jamie, if that's okay. Thanks very much, Convener. Good morning to the panel. Um, and just on that point, actually, because I, I think Chris wanted to come in, and actually, the second part of my question was going to be on, um, I suppose, the um, the impact on the availability of labour. As Mary mentioned, there, furlough is going to end. It's been extremely important. I think everybody will accept that, but it will end this autumn, um, and that's causes as concern for some, but also I know speaking to businesses, there are some that have felt that labour shortages have been uh, you know, increased because people are still uh, on furlough and jobs are being their jobs are being protected, but but there are obviously shortages uh, elsewhere. So um I think Mary's kind of covered that from her side, but I was wondering maybe if Chris uh, and then Nora would like to comment on 
um, both the kind of importance of furlough, but also how it may be impacting on labour shortages at the moment? Sure. Uh, thank you. Uh, and uh, I think you're right. The, the coronavirus job retention scheme has been hugely significant as an intervention which has, has protected jobs at, at its peak. Uh, more than almost three quarters of a million uh, people in Scotland were on some form of furlough. Uh, the latest figures show that that number has dropped significantly as the economy has begun to open up. So uh, we're seeing around about 141,000 people on furlough. Um, of that number, about half of them are on some form of flexible furlough. Um, so they are doing uh, some uh, kind of form of work. Um, we would anticipate, um, just looking at how the numbers have fallen over the last 12 months, that over the summer months, that number will have continued to uh, fall. While it's hard to be clear on specific numbers, it's clear that some people will not go back to their jobs uh, when the furlough scheme uh, ends. But I have concerns that we might lose connection with Chris, so I think, uh, Nora, you maybe wanted to comment on this point. I'll bring Nora in. Thank you. Um, uh, really, just the, um, to reiterate the, the, the points that, that Chris has made, I think that the, the impact um, on people being released from furlough will show that there will be um, skills shortages, perhaps in certain localities or regions of Scotland, um, where um, there are short, there are job vacancies, but the people will not be in the right locations for where those vacancies um, are, 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 are present an opportunity. Um, so I think that that may be one of the the key areas to look at. I think the the opportunity that will come um, at the end of furlough will be for those people who are perhaps living in rural areas. Um, will ha there is an opportunity with the use of technology because we have become more used to dealing with um, online forms of conducting business. But for those more in rural areas, remote working becomes more of a possibility, and that's an area that needs to be um, explored. I think businesses have got used to both flexible working and online working. Therefore, there will be more of a, um, a mindset by business to look at different types of um, ways of working um, that will present um, possibilities that they've probably not um, explored before. But the main thing for me. People coming out of furlough, vacancies are going to be in the wrong places for where people, where the, the demographic is based. Thanks very much for that. I think we've seen some of the problems with remote working highlighted today. And I have to say, as somebody who's <laughs> joining from Orkney, uh, I'm always terrified it's me who's been, uh, who's lost collection. So I have a uh, few sympathy with you, Chris, and um, I'm glad to see you back. Um, I, I mean, uh, I'll maybe bring you back in, Chris, and you can either finish what you want to, or, or maybe answer this. But, but I think um, what's been raised is this issue around, um, uh, you, you know, the kind of need for the need for change and what that what that means um, uh, as we go forward. And actually, the kind of other question I was going to, the, sorry, the first question I was going to ask um, has been kind of fully answered now. So, I suppose taking into the issues around um, skills, both what we need, whether it's in the right place, but also making sure that um, those people with the skills are accessible via, say, uh, the ability to work from home and work online. What do we need to see the Scottish Government doing um, uh, to, to, to meet that demand? How does the Scottish Government um, better facilitate working from home, making sure skills are in the right place and that uh, we're encouraging people into retraining where we need to? Um, if I can come to Chris more and then maybe marry on that, it would be very helpful. Thank you. Um, Thank you. If I can begin just by finishing where I was uh, cut off a moment ago, if that's okay. So I was making the point that not everyone will go back into the job that they had while they were on furlough. There will be a number of reasons underpinning that. I think we've seen lots of evidence of people taking the decision to leave the labour market. Um, the phrase "the great retire." Um, it may be that the business doesn't open up and the job is not there to return to. And um, it could also be through choice. Um, that individuals have um, decided to either change career or find another job. Um, I think it's important to note, though, that the labour market that people will be looking to go back into uh, at the end of furlough at the end of this month is much stronger than it would have, would have been uh, 18 months ago. Uh, in, in respect to the question in terms of what we need to do to respond to um, the circumstances, it's a very uh, kind of trite point, but there is no uh, kind of single answer. And we've heard 
some of the responses today. Um, for me, I think there are four or five big areas of policy that we need to focus on. One is a continuing focus on young people and their transitions into uh, the, the, the labour market and equipping them with the skills for the economy of the future, not the economy of the past. I think the second bit is about ensuring that we have got the right measures that allow people to either upskill within their jobs um, or to switch careers. Um, and the, the adoption of the National Transition uh, Training Fund uh, and the Green Jobs Workforce Academy are all kind of important moves in that uh, direction. I think we also need to be thinking quite hard about how we reconnect people who are not working um, with opportunities. So we have a we, yes, we are seeing some significant skill shortages at the moment, but there are around about three quarters of a million people in Scotland who are economically inactive, and many of those people um, could get back into the work with the right support from the state and also from employers. And I think the final kind of element for me that I, I, I know we are thinking about, but I think it's going to become really important. Is around the whole agenda of talent attraction. So yes, we absolutely want to ensure that people in Scotland are getting the right skills for jobs in Scotland. But we need to think hard about how we're bringing uh, people in uh, to the country to fill um, jobs, not just at the bottom end of the labour market, but also highly skilled jobs in the digital technology sector, financial services sector. So that becomes an important part as well. Um, Nora Senior, did you want to come in? I think Jamie has suggested you might want to come in. Uh, yeah, um, well, I was just going to just add a, a couple of um, a practical suggestions. Um, given that you know we've seen the fragility of our technology even this morning, investment in 5G and making sure that we have um, robust technology that will handle the type of online um, contacts that we need. Housing in, uh, to move people from those areas where they are currently to the areas where jobs are, and infrastructure in terms of transport to get people from um, or move around the country so that, that where there are vacancies, um, that we can easily either get them to jobs or to colleges or universities where they can um, access the type of upskilling, reskilling, and training that they need. I think actually Mary probably wanted to comment as well. Uh, Mary, would you like to come in? And then I'll move to Colin Smith's questions. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, I absolutely agree with um, the things that Nora is saying. Um, these sorts of um, infrastructure investments in order to facilitate people being in the right places or being able to fulfil roles is really important. And housing, and particularly in rural areas, is a, is a massive issue in terms of economic resilience and um, being able to keep young people in an area. Um, so that that's definitely a, a really important policy area. Um, a couple of further um, reflections. I mean, I've got a bit of a concern about um, you know the experience that young people have had um, at, at both at school and at university in the last couple of years, and you know, alongside obviously achieving qualifications, um, we're we're trying to get young people ready for the labour market of the future, as Chris has said. Um, and there's some issues around maybe the human capital development that might be a little more, bit more lacking through a disruptive period of learning um, and the experience of, of, of things like university and college. So there, there might be a wider point about that and the sort of softer skills that, that young people who are entering the labour market are maybe not getting the same sort of experience on graduate programmes on apprenticeships as they might have got in the past. So that might be something to to look at in terms of how we support people to develop that human capital. But finally, um, it, there's, there's an issue here maybe about employability services as well, um, and their link up with the skills system. Obviously, Scotland's got, got more powers now around employability, um, which, which, which the Scottish Government will be seeking to use. But how does that link up with ensuring that those people, and, and some of those people are the inactive people Chris was talking about, you know, have the right skills? How does it link up with the skill system so they can retrain um, and then employability services can find them a suitable role? So the link here between skills and employability, I think, is, is really important. Uh, thank you, Mary. Um, Colin Smith. Good morning, and good morning to the panel. Can, can I follow up on a, a point that Nora uh, Senior touched on earlier? So I, I'll direct this question to her first, and that's whether there are particular geographical parts of Scotland that, that face skill so shortages. I mean, what are these areas uh, and to what extent is this due to the fact that we import, uh, or until recently we imported, a lot of those skills? Uh, 
Um, can Nora's mic be switched please. on, please? If you start again, Nora, sorry, we missed the beginning. Sorry. Um, tourism and hospitality, obviously, um, in the north, particularly in the north of Scotland, um, there are um, construction um, in certain areas of the country. Um, I believe uh, Gary Gillespie, um, as the chief economist, has um, uh, produced a very useful um, a piece of research around demographics and um, the changing patterns of where, where work is and how people have moved during the pandemic. So that might be a useful area or, 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 or reference for the panel to look at. Um, I think that you know both Brexit and um, COVID have impacted certain sectors. Um, a, a, the ones that I've mentioned, I think one of the areas um, where we are um, open more or more exposed is perhaps on digital skills. Where a lot of design companies, for instance, or comms companies, um, because uh, the, um, we are now more used to working online, it actually opens up the competition, if you like, from international markets um, for pieces of work to be undertaken anywhere in the world. So the, um, the, the focus on digital skills for me is one of those areas where we are still lagging some of our, our international competitors. And that goes across the whole of Scotland. It's not place specific. Um, but the other, um, some of the other areas where there are um, deficits, if you like, or um, a, a lack of um, employment are sector specific around tourism, hospitality, agriculture. Okay. I'm sure my colleagues will mention other areas. Okay. Could, 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 could I ask Chris or Lisa if they've got anything to add to, to that? Is, what are they picking up? Certainly. Um, I, I, I noticed, noticed covered a number of the key points I was going to make. You know, we're seeing significant recruitment difficulties in hospitality, chefs. Uh, service staff, particularly in uh, rural areas, the food and drink sector is facing some significant challenges at the moment. Um, whether that's in seasonal agriculture, whether it's around meat processing and a, a shortage of knife skills, we know the haulage sectors uh, facing significant challenges, partly down to Brexit, um, and also the construction sector uh, as well. And we're seeing continuation of um, some pre-COVID issues, as Nora's mentioned, in the shape of uh, recruitment difficulties in health and social care. And, and digital economy. Um, I, I think the point I would make is that there's no single reason for why there is a labour shortage emerging in, in, in particular sectors. In some cases, uh, it's down to an ageing workforce. In some cases, these were sectors that were facing some recruitment difficulties uh, prior to the pandemic. Um, in many cases, these are sectors that were reliant on um, or, or more reliant than, than average in terms of using. Uh, EU labour to uh, to support the workforce. Um, I, I think the, the the approach that that we're taking to this with the SDS. I've got a team of sector managers who work across 14, 15 um, different industry sectors in Scotland. We're picking up um, information on where those specific skill shortages are, and we're looking to work with industry about how we shorten recruitment um, chains and training chains into the industry. Um, also keenly aware of some of the challenges in, in rural areas. Um, I've been part of the Team South of Scotland uh, senior officers group who meet on a weekly basis on a Tuesday morning to um, understand both what's happening in terms of the South of Scotland economy, but also the South of Scotland labour market. What's really interesting there is you're seeing some quite um, bold moves from employers um, to actually bring people into the labour uh, into the, the workforces. They're offering uh, different terms of conditions and better wages. They're offering golden hellos. Uh, they're offering loyalty bonuses. So I think what we will see over the uh, over the, the, the immediate future is, is actually some moves from employers to try and secure their supply chains and their um, and their, their staff as well. That's, uh, that, that's really interesting. I, I, I wouldn't abuse my position by pursuing the south of Scotland one today, but I may come back to that, Chris. Uh, can, I, can I, I raise the same point with Mary? But can I also ask, and Mary, I mean, are the, the geographical uh, areas affected by the, the skills and, and labour shortages the same areas that, that maybe have been disproportionately impacted by the pandemic itself? I know that at an early stage, the Fraser Valander Institute carried out some work uh, on the disproportionate impact of pan the pandemic on rural areas. I mean, is, is, mm. is it, are, 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 they, are, are these areas facing a double whammy of being hit by the pandemic and 
obviously now facing some of the, the, the skill shortage issues. Or has that changed since that early piece of work was done? Because I know it was some time ago. <laughs> I mean, we, we've um, we've continued to look at this, um, you know, uh, partly through the lens of um, ambitions around levelling up and the impacts um, of the pandemic. Um, you know, um, so we have continued to look at it, and so no, it hasn't really changed. It, it is the case that, given um, tourism and hospitality was hit so hard during the pandemic, and and continues to maybe uh, operate at reduced capacity. Um, even even now, even though a lot of restrictions have been removed, um, it's still the case, therefore, that those areas which are more dependent on that are likely to have been hit much harder. Um, although we're getting more information all the time, and I think once we see what happens when furlough ends, we'll get a better understanding of the long-term impacts of um, productive capacity in different parts of Scotland. And what you do see is, obviously, in rural areas, tourism and hospitality businesses were more um, dependent uh, on things like EU labour to to help fill vacancies. So in a, in a way, there, there is that kind of double whammy. It's both um, businesses may have been hit harder, um, and also um, as things do open up and get better, it might mean that they have less capacity to grow um, as, as we would like them to in order to support the economy because they just cannot get the supply of labour that they need now um, due, due to us um, leaving the, the, um, the EU. Um, so, social care is another one that was particularly dependent on EU labour, and obviously, um, that, that's in the news for lots of reasons in the last couple of days um, in terms of funding social care um, appropriately. Um, and, and that's, that's um, a big issue around that is obviously about um, the terms and conditions and the salaries and so on in social care. But some of it is also just about the supply of people with the appropriate skills who, who wish to work in that industry. Which again we've plugged in the past from, from through EU labour. So um, I suppose it is a bit of a double whammy for these areas, um, which were particularly dependent on tourism and hospitality in their economies. Okay, um, thank you very much. I'll now move over to Fiona Hislop. Uh, thank you and good morning. I want to um, look, look ahead uh, to cover just transition, but also uh, demography and labour uh, issues as well. Um, firstly, on just transition, it was very welcome to see the Scottish Government's response to the Just Transition Commission uh, just published yesterday. And there's obviously a big challenge in making sure that we've got the skills that we need and we have that transition. Um, I was very pleased to see that this, there was a skills guarantee uh, agreement and that there would be an, an just transition uh, response. That's good. But my concern is how do we at scale uh, ensure that we've got the appropriate skills needed for what's required? So may, maybe from your point of view, um, Nora, in particular, if you can uh, consider the aspects of working with employers, industrial training boards, and also with our, our skills provision, uh, who's taking responsibility for the mapping um, of existing skills uh, that many of our energy workers have to move into the new sector? And is there a sense of ownership of that? Or to what extent is it being left as a almost like a free market operation? Uh, and what changes are needed to, to deliver this in the future? So thank you for that question. Good question. Um, one of the things that the Enterprise and Skills Board was look, um, did was look at the, the role of the industry leadership groups in reinvigorating yeah. um, their role within the whole um, Enterprise and Skills system. And the reason for that was, um, or one of the tasks that we wanted to give them was to map out the assets, if you like, in their sector. So that they had an understanding of um, the types of companies, the number of companies, the location of companies, and the capability of those companies. So I think that um, ILGs in um, in a, a new invigorated role can play a bigger um, can play a bigger role in um, being able to um, not only identify the kind of skill shortages, but also using business to business. Um, contacts across that whole um, infrastructure or framework of ILGs, look at business um, uh, creating its own training programmes and being able to feed into colleges and universities to support and enable the types of um, skills that need to be generated. 
And Kristen, Lisa would also be a good to answer on this question, having done um, a lot around the, the climate emergency and where, um, you know, how they see the skills mapping coming forward. But I think that one of the areas that, that we do need to look at is how we use existing structures, such as the enterprise agency and the industry leadership groups, to um, facilitate um, and map out, identify the types of skills that, that we do need. And by cross-referencing, if you like, um, the, the knowledge from each of those groups being able to create with private sector led, I don't think this all has to be government led or public money led. I think you know that we need to rely on industry to be able to um you know fend for itself in many of these areas, um, supported by uh, the you know the education system, further than higher education system. Um, but I mean that's mainly what I would say is use use the existing infrastructure and framework to be able to identify apply skills and work with the uh, colleges, universities, and private sector training providers in order to map out um, a route map to the skills that we need for the future, which are going to change and evolve on an ongoing basis. But Chris or Lisa might like to come in um, and, and add to that in terms of the work that you've done in CSAP. Chris. Thanks and good morning. Um, the, the, I mean, in terms of the transition to net zero, I think it's going to be the single dominant economic driver in Scotland over the next uh, 15 years, and it is a 15-year uh, programme of work. I think what we've got is a clear direction, certainly where the economic investment is going to flow in the first five years of that transition. So it's around the decarbonisation of energy, it's around decarbonisation of transport, it's around making our uh, homes and houses and buildings uh, kind of energy efficient. The, the approach we've taken in the Climate Emergency Skills Action Plan is to focus on that opportunity, and those are not the only opportunities. Um, but to say, do we have one a clear understanding of what the specific demand for skills is going to be to support that transition? And secondly, do we know whether we are currently investing uh, in the right place in support of that? Um, I work with uh, the Climate Emergency Skills uh, Action Plan Implementation Steering Group. That's chaired by Professor Dave Ray from uh, Edinburgh University. It includes representation from Scotland's colleges, Scotland's universities, the Funding Council ourselves, the enterprise agencies, trade unions, uh, and that group is wrestling with those those key questions. You know, do we understand where um, the demand for skills is likely to impact? Um, and I think it's important to recognise that. Um, the transition to net zero will drive demand for skills in a number of ways. There will be jobs that we already have that we're going to need more people trained up um, in those disciplines, whether that be you know, town planners or engineers. There will be jobs that will be affected by the transition to net zero. The classic example is um, a heating engineer who's going to have to move from fitting gas boilers to uh, fitting uh, heat pumps. And then there will be jobs that we do not know um, uh, uh, exist yet. Um, uh, technologies will emerge over the piece. Uh, the, the point I would, would make is that that effort is beyond just industry, it's beyond just government, it's beyond just colleges and universities. That collaboration, both to understand where jobs are going to be, where skills are going to be required, and ensure we get things in place, is going to be absolutely critical over the next five years and beyond. And can I follow that up by saying that you know, we might not know what some of those future jobs are, but we certainly know what some of the more immediate ones are. And who is taking responsibility for the mapping of the existing skills that, for example, oil and gas workers have that could then be translated into um, the, the future of renewable energies? And who's taking ownership of making sure that happened? And in terms of retrofitting, you, you referred to that as well. We don't need to ask the questions of what will be required. We know what will be required. So again, who's taking taking responsibility for ensuring not only have we got the skill base, but also the volume of workers that we will need um, to, to deliver what was in the programme for government yesterday. So responsibility in terms of the, the demand side is pretty dispersed. Um, we're working with colleagues in Apito uh, in the North East, looking at specifically the skill sets that um, workers in the oil and gas sector may have that can be redeployed. We're working with uh, Glasgow City Council, looking at some of the specific skills requirements which flow from their uh, retrofitting programme. We've got a programme of work underway across, the, uh, across SDS and SFC to look at what we know and critically what we don't know. So there's a, 
there's a strong commitment from government and its agencies to ensure that we've got that demand side in place. In terms of the response for ensuring that those skills are met, again, I would argue that that's a, that's a dispersed response that's required. Uh, so both um, the Funding Council and SDS are deploying uh, national transition training fund activity. We've also launched the Rangers Workforce Academy, uh, which identifies immediate opportunities as well as immediate training opportunities. Um, there is a big responsibility in our college and university sector, and I'm not laying that responsibility on them. They recognise that's there. That's why they're active um, around um, the, the Climate Emergency Skills Action Plan to ensure that the training opportunities that are available match the opportunities that we're seeing in the, the labour market. And if I can move on to issues around demography and differentiating between labour shortages as opposed to skill shortages, and maybe for Mary Sparridge um, from Fraser Valander Institute, what analysis have you taken of uh, Scotland's pre-existing pre-pandemic um, dem demographic challenges and what you are forecasting for the future in terms of actual labour availability? And to what extent um, are we focusing on skills when we should be focusing on actual labour issues? Yeah, I mean, they're both, they're both issues for um, the Scottish labour market in the future. Um, we know pre-pandemic there was um, a skills mismatch, you know, in terms of what we need um, and what we actually have in the country. And, you know, the research would suggest that that can be one of the reasons for, for poor or sluggish productivity growth. So we know that was an issue already. So the, the, the labour that we have here um, did not have the skills that employers needed. It, there, wasn't, there was a mismatch. But... The outlook for demography is also a concern. We just will, will not, um, it looks like, have, um, we, you know, we will have a fallen working age population um, as we go forward. Now, some of that is, is due to um, um, the, uh, the outlook for migration prior to Brexit. Even then, it wasn't good. Um, and now that, that this has happened and there's been this dis disruption um, in migration flows, the outlook is, is, is even worse. Um, and that particularly impacts on, um, on certain parts of Scotland. So the outlook, for example, for Edinburgh and the surrounds is for that population to, to continue to increase, um, even at working age population. Whereas um, for the west of Scotland and in rural Scotland, the outlook is pretty poor. But it's worth saying that those are projections of previous trends. So that's what we've seen over the last 10 years or so in terms of movement in population within Scotland. Um, and obviously, policy makers can think about how they can introduce policies that we may help um, reverse that decline, such as um, in areas of housing that we've already discussed. So, um, the current projections that have been produced by the ONS and the National Records of Scotland are not great for Scotland. Those do not take account of the policy disruption which was caused by Brexit. So, the outlook um, is likely to be worse than that. Um, and it's particularly bad for certain parts of Scotland. Um, and I, I, I should declare an interest. I actually represent the most populous constituency in the whole of Scotland. I've got more constituents than MDL, so, but I am very concerned about the demographic outlook. And um, perhaps the final word to, to Nora, maybe, in terms of um, employers looking at um, future investment and you know, the, the uh, position of Scotland as an attractive place for cutting edge companies to come and do business in terms of future proposition. Uh, what's your outlook on that, both from a demographic point of view, but also in that, that skills way, the, the kind of overview for the future that you might want to, to share with us, Nora? Um, uh, Scotland is an attractive place to work. I think that um, you know, we should remember that um, you know, our skills system is um, you know, is still looked upon by competitor countries as being, um, you know, uh, um, if not excellent, it's certainly, um, you know, best in class in a number of areas. We have a workforce that has um, more qualifications than, than most other competitor countries. So we have a highly skilled workforce. And it's that workforce that, um, and its ability to be able to flex into other areas that will um, uh, provide the incentive for uh, potential inward investors to look at Scotland as a potential place to come and stay. I think that there is more work that could be done with SDI in partnership with Visit Scotland to promote um, Scotland as an attractive place um, to, to live and work. Um, and I think that there is more that we should be doing on um, 
setting uh, or, or for government to give um, an indication of its ambition around certain areas, say um, net zero, um, so that uh, or allowing uh, uh, around life sciences, for instance. But if we have um, a strategy which can identify priorities, then business is um, feels much more confident in investing. Um, in those particular sectors and those particular places where we feel that government is fully supportive um, and that sort of de-risks for business um, their, their sort of investment and their focus. Um, so that, those would be some of the comments that I would make on um, in response. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll now bring in Colin Beattie to be followed by Alexander Burnett. I'll go Colin first. Thank you, convener. I'd, I'd like to take you back to those sunlit days before COVID and uh, Brexit. Skill shortages are not a new thing. Uh, back in that period, there were perhaps uh, a number of sectors that were under pressure, and IT is perhaps uh, one of the most obvious. If we compare the skill shortages then with the skill shortages that we have at the moment, uh, are there new sectors that have come under pressure because of skill, set, skill shortages? And if so, is it possible to identify whether it's Brexit or COVID that's been the cause of that? M maybe, maybe I could ask uh, uh, Chris maybe to comment on that. Sure, thank you. It's a, it's a great question, um, and it's a very difficult one to answer definitively. I think one of the features of what has happened over the last 18 months has been that interplay between uh, COVID and Brexit, and actually they've they, they've amplified each other in some respects, and um, not too many places uh, cancelled each other out. In terms of the specific question around, are the places where we're seeing skill shortages largely the same as where we were? By and large, it's in similar places. So the hospitality sector uh, struggled to recruit. Um, the food and drink sector struggled to recruit. Road haulage issues have been. Uh, an issue that I know the industry has been concerned about for a long time, uh, kind of prior to the pandemic. I think what we're seeing is a, a concertina of recruitment activity and change in the labour market that you normally expect to see over kind of five years taking place in a very short period of time. So I think some of the labour shortages we're seeing at the moment are down to firms reopening quickly and being hungry for labour. Um, partly they're down, I think, to I think mean, there's lots of evidence to suggest that lots of EU nationals may have gone home during the pandemic to their home country and have not been able to return. Um, but we're also beginning to see emerging skill shortages, which are as a, as a result of change in the demand for skills in the wider economy that are not related to either of those two, to either Brexit or COVID. So I think you can argue um, with some justification that some of the pressures we're seeing around the next year of transition are a bit of change in the economy rather than either of those two external shocks. Would you, from what you're saying there, Brexit and COVID have perhaps accelerated some of the changes so that the skill shortages that we're seeing now would have come anyway, but maybe further down the line or more gently. Would that be correct? I, I think what I'm saying is what Brexit and COVID in particular has done has driven a pace of change in the economy that, that nobody anticipated prior to uh, the pandemic, the, the fall off in high street retail, for example, and the growth of online retail was expected to take place over a five to ten year period. It's happened in 18 months. Um, I think the, um, the challenge around labour shortages is a complex one and skill shortages is a complex one. Some of it's down to workforce demographics, some of it's down to actually how attractive or otherwise those sectors are for people to move into. And some of it is down to the, the, the cold effects. And I, hate, I hate to say this, but it's a, a phrase a colleague of mine uses all the time. It's called a labour market for a reason. Um, and actually, what we are seeing is that mismatch between both skills that people have, but the availability of people, and how hungry some businesses are uh, for staff at this moment in time. Perhaps I can invite uh, Nora Senior to comment. Yeah, I just adding to that. I mean, one of the the, the main areas where um, we previously and still have a deficit is around the whole software, digital, and technology skills area, and that's partly because we don't have uh, the teachers or lecturers who have the in, in great enough numbers 
um, that can teach those type of sk skills to you know the generations that are coming through or upskilling and reskilling. So it, it is that that for me is a significant challenge. Anyone who has software engineering skills um, is immediately snapped up by industry um, rather than move into an education environment, which means that there is always a lapse for those that perhaps are teaching um, those skills in in an education uh, situation or an academic situation. Are perhaps teaching um, technologies which are more redundant um, or outdated um, than what our employers and, and industries using at the moment. So there is a, a, a disconnect without a sink, if you like, in terms of the knowledge exchange which is coming through to our younger people moving through the education system. And that is something that, unless we address and probably incentivise how we um, um, get more teachers to 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 bring um, software engineering technology skills into education at a much earlier stage. Then we are always going to be challenged by um, lagging behind some of our international counterparts. Just on that specific point, um, are are we behind other countries in Europe or rest of UK in this? Is it a problem specific to Scotland, or is it is it a common issue that everybody is struggling with? I mean, I would, I'd, I'd um, probably pass that to Mary to um, have a think about. From an employer's point of view, um, I, I sometimes look to uh, Hong Kong and China to carry out um, digital uh, pieces of work that I know I'm not going to, or, or um, sometimes even you know, Ukraine and Eastern Europe. Um, because they seem to be further ahead, both in the speed of their technologies, many having 5G already installed, and because of the, the technical competence of some of the, um, the, the talent that I can find out there. Um, and it usually comes in at a, a cheaper price than we can do it, because, because we have a skill shortage in both Scotland and the UK, um, then uh, those sectors can charge premium rates, so we are already um, you know, sort of challenging ourselves, if you like, or missing opportunities because other countries can do that faster um, and more cost effectively. Do I think that that's just a, um, a problem which is endemic to Scotland? It's probably not, but Marie would probably, Marie would probably have a better perspective than that on me. Uh, Marie, yes, it's not, it's not. Yeah, it's not unique to Scotland in terms of the, the skills that are in high demand across the, the globe. I guess um, one of the issues that, that's different now um, following our exit from the transition period is, is perhaps some of the policies, solutions that we relied on before are now not there um, as an option in terms of being able to attract people seamlessly from the EU, um, which and obviously there's um, much greater scope for people to, to move around within the EU now. Um, on the continent, so it's um, so. So I guess some of the solutions that we maybe have found in the past, which you, you know you could call stick and plasters in terms of you know making sure we have um, a domestic labour market that's that's meeting the needs of of the businesses here, um, just aren't open to us anymore, or it's likely that there'll be much more, there'll be more fr friction, or it won't be as easy for people to relocate here as it maybe was in the past, particularly from the EU. So. Um, but I, I don't think these these challenges are, are unique to Scotland. Um, but the challenges, particularly in rural areas, are just particularly pertinent for Scotland, I suppose, um, given our large rural population uh, and large rural land mass and our, our reliance on, on hospitality and tourism, for example. I'd like to invite Lisa in there. Um, just to make one comment, though, and building on what Fiona Hislop said earlier, will these lack of skills homegrown skills here in Scotland impact on investment into the, into the economy in general, is it likely that that will happen? Because, you know, obviously people rely on us here in Scotland having the skills to be, you know, being a highly skilled nation and, uh, you know, being at the high end of it. It doesn't sound like we're there with this. Lisa. Yeah, can I add just a couple of remarks with regards to um, whether or not Scotland is alone in facing some of these challenges? And I think um, I don't think we are. Just to, to follow on from what my colleagues were saying, um, but 
I think, common to most uh, post-industrial economies. There's the issue of responsiveness of the skills system, and inevitably, when there's technological advancement that is happening as rapidly as we've seen over the course of the, of the past year, uh, uh, you know, accelerated by the pandemic, there's a bit of a there's inevitable, inevitably a bit of a lag within the education and skills system, and so. Pro providing and embedding responsiveness into the education and skills system is something that is um, common and is a common challenge across across the globe, really. Um, but what I would say is that in aligning our skills system to the accelerating trends that we're seeing in, in work, we've got a lot of advantages and strengths to build out from, particularly within our work-based learning um, provision. So, in that regard, you know, there are innovations in work-based learning where individuals are learning in work and the realities of where that technologies are being advanced um, and, and therefore are able to you know, d continually develop and, re and refine their skins that are in alignment with what employers require. And just to follow on from a previous point that was made around about meta skills being critically important. Um, and been a, a central feature of what um, all world economies are looking for going forward. We've all, we're also um, in quite a strong position in Scotland with regards to that, because we've been piloting approaches to embedding meta skills within our apprenticeship system, um, and, and also the assessment and certification of those, which has been highlighted by o the OECD as really you know a, a significant strength of our system. So, I think in terms of um, you know, inward investment and people looking to Scotland as having a skilled population, there are some um, firm foundations that we can build out from. But I'll pass on. I see Chris is looking to come in on inward investment specifically. Th thanks, Lisa. And, uh, you're right to point out, and I think Norris pointed out this morning, that Scotland's skills base is uh, very attractive to uh, inward investors. Scotland's record in terms of attracting inward investment over the last 15 years has, has been uh, kind of exceptional. I think there are a number of things we do differently in Scotland that uh, I'm afraid uh, we've lost Chris on the connection. Do you have any other questions, Colin? No, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll now bring in Alexander Burnett. Uh, thank you, convener. I know members of my registered interest as an employer across a number of sectors. Uh, my first question was for Chris, so uh, <laughs> I don't know if he's back or not. If you maybe direct the question to Lisa, who is also here from Skill Development Scotland, and if Chris comes back in, we can go. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, it's really just for my uh, clarification around, around your remit. Uh, Mari's touched on the care service. Uh, you know, one of the biggest shortages we have is you know, nearly 5,000 nurses across Scotland. Nearly 10% of those are in NHS Grampian. Uh, I was just wondering, with your, your regional and sector hats on, uh, what your remit is in, in tackling uh, that particular shortage, uh, and if you don't have a direct role uh, in that, what interaction do you have with those bodies that do, uh, just to make sure you're not sort of competing and w w a bit of joined up thinking? So I am, so I am back now. <laughs> I think that's quick. I, I did manage to catch that. Apologies for the connectivity issues that are out, out with my control. Um, it, it's a great question, um, and I'll answer it in relation both to our engagement in the North East as well as our engagement with the health and social care sector. So, in SDS, we, our, our work is about working with partners on a regional and sectoral basis. So, I was one of the authors of a regional skills strategy in the North East about three years ago, and one of the issues that that highlighted were challenges in relation to recruitment across a whole range of sectors in the North East that did not pay the premium of oil and gas sector, including uh, kind of health and social care. Um, I have got a sector manager colleague who works directly with Public Health Scotland uh, and NHS Education for Scotland as well. As, um, and what we do is, similar to other industry sectors, is look at how the demand for skills within those sectors is changing and growing. That insight is then fed into both our apprenticeship demand assessment. It's also shared with colleagues in the college and university sector. Uh, and as Nora uh, knows, we work closely with colleagues in the funding council to ensure that we've got um, the volume of provision aligned against where we see uh, needs emerging. Uh, the issue in the northeast, 
is, is a complex one. There's pupil dynamics and housing dynamics there. Um, so actually, very often, one of the reasons that there are labour shortages in some sectors, or historically there have been labour shortages in the North East, is that people at the lower end of the labour market often can't afford to uh, buy property and live in the North East. So it's, it's, um, it's a complex picture. We work in partnership. The point we'd make is not every skills shortage has a skills issue um, necessarily at its root. Uh, thank you. Uh, my sec second question, uh, if I could direct this to Nora, um, it was on the furlough coming to an end. I know it's been answered uh, to some extent uh, already, uh, but a lot of the answers have really been quite sort of hypothetical about you know, this might happen or we're expecting this. I was just wondering what actual uh, work or, or mapping, as I think it's been referred to, uh, has been done uh, with those currently on furlough who, who will, you know, be leaving furlough at the end of the month, or is it a case of uh, we just have to wait and see what happens uh, when the next unemployment figures turn up? Um, in fairness, I think uh, again, um, Gary Gillespie and Mary, um, Mary's team have obviously, uh, has been helping on this, is mapping where furlough is and which sectors have been affected. Um, to some extent, this is going to be down to individual businesses to look at. Um, you know what their business uh, projections are going forward and how they manage um, to survive or grow or um, or, or not uh, within the pandemic. So um, I couldn't say across the board that you know business hand on heart has a handle on itself as to you know what its um, its own business cases are going to be going forward. So. It is slightly a case of wait and see. I think that um, employers are trying to hang on to their people as best they, as best they can, um, but the financial pressure on PLs um, is, is such that you know it will come down to individual businesses making decisions about um, how much they can sustain and what they need to do to make sure that they have a viable a viable concern going forward. But Mary might have something to add to that in terms of mapping. Yeah, I mean the the the, the largest sector that's still using furlough is, is accommodation and food services. So, um, you know, they, they are. This was at the end of June. These are the latest statistics we have, and obviously, throughout July and August, there's more employer contributions being expected. So we would expect a sharp fall off as we go into July, but we still see a significant number of people in the accommodation, food services, or or arts, recreation, and culture, where some of these sorts of businesses might be classified. Um, but there is still significant numbers um, on on furlough and, and businesses like construction and, and other things. And as Chris says, some of these are flexible furlough. Um, but in terms of what might happen when um, you know the the furlough scheme comes to an end, it's difficult to say. We are seeing these shortages in in construction, in hospitality, in certain parts of the country when people are still on furlough. So it's really only after we see. Um, how that shakes out, and whether some people are are then released from their their employment and able to seek other employment, which may deal with some of the shortages, um, that we'll really know, um, you know, you know what the long term impacts might be. Uh, thank you, and and just my final question. Hopefully, not straying too much from the, the skills uh, shortage, but it's been touched on already. Uh, you know, the, the labour shortage. So, question to Mari. You, you've already mentioned uh, productivity. Uh, you know, we've spoken before about you know, cheap imported labour uh, has you know, prevented or suppressed uh, wage increases, but but also uh, been a substitute for investment in automation. Uh, it seems uh, pre-COVID almost, or certainly a long time since we've seen prototypes of uh, robots picking raspberries. Uh, but I just wonder, you know, what have you seen in the last year in terms of uh, investment uh, in automation to address some of these problems? Um, well, um, in terms of what businesses are telling us, they've, um, you know, it's obviously different in different sectors, but there's been a huge amount of investment in um, different ways of working, <laughs> as we're doing at the moment, um, from businesses pretty much across the board. Um, other adaptations that businesses have made have been about how they deal with their their workforce and the flexibility they give them and and these sorts of things which are important um are less tangible investments but they're also important for um improving productivity in the workforce in terms of the impact that management practice um, can have on um on people's um productivity 
Um, so I think the focus has, has mostly been on, on that. Um, there is some evidence from um, this year, um, particularly after the budget, when the, the Chancellor announced the super deductor for plant and machinery investment, that that has driven some investment in different businesses. Um, but it's kind of too early to see what the impact of that might be. Um, so obviously the government, um, principally the UK government in this case, may look for other um, incentives to um, allow businesses to invest in, 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 in R&D or other types of investment to be able to, um, to develop new technologies or new products and services for their customers. Um, so it's a bit early to say in terms of what the impact of that investment might be um, and how much impact it might have on productivity in the long run. Thank you. That's all. Uh, thank you. Uh, Michelle Thompson. Uh, good morning uh, to everybody. Uh, I've got a couple of questions which I'll run together uh, for all of you. Uh, picking up from Colin's question earlier regarding international skills, has either the Fraser of Allender Institute or Skills Development Scotland undertaken specific recent analysis comparing Scotland's skills system to those of our major trading nations set out in Scotland at a, a trading nation? In other words, how do we know that Nora's comment, our skills system is looked upon as best in class, is actually true? That's my first question. My second question is, I hold a personal view that international benchmarking for Scotland's skills system is necessary. Do you agree with my personal view? And if not, why not? So that's a question for everybody. So perhaps, Mary, you might like to go first. <laughs> Um, we've, we've not done um, any analysis on competing the, the skills systems or um, or anything like that. I mean, oh, one of the um, key benchmarks that's looked at when um, you know competing across Europe or across the world is is the qualification skill level in the population, and that Scotland always does very well on that measure. And we do have a highly skilled population in terms of um, qualifications that people achieve. Um, and the, the percentages, for example, achieving tertiary education. Whether that means that the workforce has the skills that are required by the labour market is, is a different issue, and we do have a skills mismatch, as we've already discussed. Um, but um, the, given Nora um, sort of said, said the, the thing about being best in class, I'll let her, um, I'll let her cover why, why that is. So when the um, Enterprise and Skills Board was first uh, set up, we carried out um, a piece of work into comparators um, of, uh, from, of Scotland against OECD countries. Um, the reason for doing that was to move us from fourth quartile, where we sit in many things, to um, upper quartile or first top quartile. One of the gaps that we, our productivity was one of the areas that we looked at. Um, along with another, a number of other indicators, but where, we, where Scotland came out high was on um, the higher level of qualifications that our workforce have. Um, the conundrum for us was um, if we have such high levels of qualification and skilled people, why do we have lower productivity? And partly that uh, skills underutilisation. Um, the underutilisation. Um, and looking at productivity, people taking jobs that they are overskilled for um, is partly because um, the, 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 the jobs are not there in the areas where perhaps the, the qualifications um, come through. So that really goes back to um, Lisa's point about meta skills, the importance of meta skills and being able to flex and transfer those higher level qualifications into um, new types of jobs as well as um, existing jobs. Um, but we do have a higher qualified workforce, so that's not the problem in terms of um, giving people education and qualifications. It's in using those qualifications in a way that we can become uh, or productivity is increased. I would just also mention on that that in terms of um, business investment in um, uh, innovation and automation, um, we should, that again was one of the indicators where uh, Scotland performed much uh, more poorly than we see competitor countries. 
business investment in innovation partly comes from, and I go back to what I was saying um, in part of my very first comment around um, enhancing management and leadership. Where we sometimes struggle is in the ability of, and capability of our managers and leaders to be able to scale up businesses. Um, they are trained technically in the knowledge of the product or service that the company is selling, but not necessarily in how to scale up um, a business uh, around uh, creating bigger teams, knowing where to invest knowing where to go to look for the types of innovation that might help their company, and also look at other practices and um, good models of, of workplace practice around fair work. So, actually, the, uh, although we have higher levels of skill, uh, of qualifications, what we need to do um, is increase the ability and, and capabilities of our, and talent of our, our management and leadership. And then we should be able to see a greater leap in productivity. I don't know if anyone else wants to come in on these first two questions before we move on. I think I would just add here that um, we have, uh, particularly for the skill system and the apprenticeship system, and we've received a number of, we've, we've been engaging with the OECD um, to look at how we can strengthen the skill system in Scotland, and they outline some of the kind of impressive developments that we've undertaken within the Scottish apprenticeship, apprenticeship system um, over the last decade. In particular, um, you know, really good in, um, labour market outcomes for, for learners and employee satisfaction. That's all really positive. We've increased our, our apprenticeship numbers. And, and similarly, we've introduced foundation and graduate apprenticeships within the within the skill system, which we know are are being really well utilised within within the labour within uh, the education skill and skill system. Also, I think one of the successes is that those opportunities are enabling um, and opening up um, higher levels of skill development to people from an increasingly diverse backgrounds. And so, um, I think the apprenticeship system. Um, could be uh, certainly considered as, as, as high performing, particularly with these new innovations that we've undertaken over the past few while. And that's really important because, as you know, apprenticeships are developed in partnership um, and significantly with employers. And we've ad ad developed a new model where we're developing apprenticeship st standards with employees and employers together to make sure that you know, the realities of the jobs that people are going to be undertaking are, are represented within the learning components that they undertake, but also that has a view to the future and how the, how the, what the future of that occupation might be. Um, so that innovation in itself has been heralded as is, is really important. And that's based on um, it's based on our um, research and interactions with other more mature apprenticeship systems across OECD countries like um, Switzerland, for example, who helped us to develop that kind of approach. I suppose what I would say is, in agreement with Nora, is that there are some significant strengths within our education and skills system. Um, and I, I forgot the second question. Apologies, uh, uh, Michelle. Yeah, no, I mean they were they were long run to get. <laughs> I, I merely expressed a view that international benchmarking. Uh, could be desirable, particularly going back to Nora's comment about digital and the, com the threat of competition from digital. Uh, we might choose not to internationally benchmark across every sector, but the emerging sectors, we are, and we've already discussed this, so it was just to see whether you agreed, agreed with that view in principle that international benchmarking is a good thing. I think so, yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, um, well, actually, I think, uh, Lisa, you probably must have guessed what my second uh, area that I wanted to explore was about, and that, funnily enough, is about modern uh, apprenticeships. Um, looking at uh, SDS's most recently quarterly report on modern uh, apprenticeships, 
uh, a theme I've been looking uh, since joining the Parliament is a uh, different uh, kind of consideration given to the role of women, whether it's in business or schools and so on. And I have worked out that comparing the first quarter 2019 to 2020 and then 2021 to 22, there's been a decline uh, from 47% of female enrolments to 45%. I then, of course, looked in my own area, which is uh, Falkirk, and a more dramatic fall in Falkirk from 45% to 35% of females. And that, that led me to consider what might be the, the, the gaps in terms of how we are going about this for women and getting them enrolled. Uh, and I wondered if you had any thoughts about the reasons for this, either Chris or Lisa. I'm happy to, to, to make some remarks about that. I, um, I, think, I think the first thing to say is that apprenticeships are offering flexible and, and experiential learning experiences and it's and as I was saying before it does open up opportunities to people from a range of different backgrounds including um, in the, particularly in the case of graduate apprenticeships older adults and and those from underrepresented groups so you know by virtue of kind of catering for different learning styles apprenticeships really can play um, an important role in supporting an increasingly diverse workforce what I would say about um, in terms of uh, recruitment into apprenticeships, that's primarily the responsibility of the employer and, and the uptake of apprenticeships tends to reflect the demographics of the wider workforce that, that, that exists within each sector. Um, but our own part within SDS, we've produced you know, equalities action plans for apprenticeships and for our career information advice and guidance services and others. And we are taking action to make sure that we've got greater um, engagement between providers and employers, particularly in relation to inclusive recruitment. Um, we've got stronger partnership working with schools to promote um, and encourage the recruitment of equality groups. And we are um, we're improving the signposting of resources for those that might require any additional support needs to, to be um, taken cognizance of, either for learners, employers and staff too. So um, I think I suppose there are improvements that can certainly be made and that we've got we've got an eye to them. But I wouldn't want to, to, to miss the, the point to say that apprenticeships, as we know um, from research across across the globe, you know, in countries like Germany, Switzerland and Austria, really can provide not just a, a pathway for individual skill um, development, but it can be a really, really useful and positive driver of economic growth and social equ uh, equality. So that, are, as I say, we've got these these kind of things in place to make sure that we are advancing on on, on where we've got to so far. Chris may want to make some additional remarks. I don't think we can see uh, Chris on the screen. I think uh, perhaps oh, he's, he's dropped again. Disappeared. <laughs> okay. Uh, Nora, just picking up on that before we move in, um, Lisa's comment about its employers that will, will um, you know, drive the take-up of modern apprenticeships and therefore they have a role in these figures that I've outlined for women. Uh, I mean, we, we know we both encounter systemic issues in the role of women in business in various sectors and so on, but I wondered if you had any final reflections on this point before we move on. You're on silent, uh, Laura. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, I, <laughs> that's going to be the, the thing we all remember about, you know, you're on mute, isn't it? <laughs> the catchphrase of the, cat, the pandemic. Um, I really just agree with them, you know, the comments that, that Lisa made. Um, I think where employers are concerned, um, we, there is still work that needs to be done um, around um, women in business, around women startups. Um, around apprenticeships, um, I, I think that you know the whole um, the whole diversity issue. It, it, it is being addressed, but it's not. It needs to be accelerated. I think perhaps one of the benefits actually of the pandemic is is um, the uh, the attitude of bus most businesses towards both um, flexible working and to remote working, and that does lead to opportunities. Or more inclusion in um, a, in women in business, and also for a new women's enterprises to to start up. So that's where some of the focus of business support actually needs to 
to go um, for that, you know, to stimulate that particular sector of society. Okay, thank you. Uh, just a last wee um, question then uh, for yourself, Nora, and then a general question for you all, and I'll run them together again. Uh, both, Nora, you, you and I would both agree that competitiveness in business is really important. Uh, the recent Cumberford Little report commissioned for the Scottish Government emphasised a shift towards excellence in skills rather than a focus on competence that we have at the moment. Uh, so I'm wondering to what extent uh, you agree with, with the, their statements in their report and to SDS, uh, what is your view on how to best keep the, the knowledge and skills of government agencies current in the light of the huge global challenges and changes, Brexit and COVID and so on? For Has SDS, for example, instigated your own programme of change around your skills based as we emerge from Brexit and COVID? So two separate areas, but I'm aware of time. So, Laura, if you want to respond to first. I'll kick off um, excellence in skills, um, I, I mean, I have um, a great admiration for uh, the Cumberford Little Report. I think they talked a lot of common sense. Um, I think that, you know, in terms of excellence in skills, what they're aiming for was the inclusion and co-production and co-design of um, courses by employers, which would be, which would mean that there would be um, a more rounded individual um, able to slot more seamlessly into the types of employment that were available. So, um, you know, I think that is a good aspiration to try and work towards and attain. I think that their ideas of having employer hubs where um, businesses can be much more integrated into the whole um, college and university framework, particularly on a regional economic basis, um, is to be welcomed. So, yes, I do support that. Okay, thank you. And the last question, a slightly cheeky one, I appreciate to SDS, but a bit of fun to wind up the session. Chris or Lisa's fine. Oh, Chris, you're on silent as well. Uh, apologies. Um, apologies again, I'm having dreadful connectivity issues. Um, so it's a great question. Um, so what are we doing to ensure that our staff's skill space is keeping up to date in relation to the challenges we've seen in the, the pandemic? Um, we, uh, the, one of the teams that I run um, is responsible, uh, along with Lisa's team, for generating insight and intelligence on where the economy and the labour market is now. That's primarily my job. Uh, and Lisa's uh, team is about understanding the factors that are going to impact on the economy and the labour market going forward. We've got a huge commitment to actually that information doesn't sit in my head and Lisa's head. We cascade that through our frontline staff and across all of our teams. We were recently assessed by EFQM, um, which is an international kind of benchmarking organisation looking at culture organisation. We were, I believe, the first organisation to get a seven-star EFQM rating uh, in Scotland. And that what, what struck the assessors was the commitment that we've got to both everyday leadership and actually, uh, in addition to that, uh, kind of staff development. Lisa, I don't know if you want to add any more detail from, from your side of the world. Yeah, just, just at one point, um, I think that the, the intelligence and the insights that you've talked about there, Chris, are critical and we're, we're engaging, we're, and it will be the basis for which we think about how do we develop our next strategic plan. And we're in the process of engaging and um, using that kind of foresight to think about the future generally of Scotland, Scotland's economy, our, our, and us, and the future of work as SDS as an organisation. And we've we're arranging a number of, um, we're engaging all staff really in that, in that discourse. So we're thinking about what does that mean, not just for our products and services, what does it mean for us as our, as our people and for, and for us as individuals? And I think that's really critical. And we will be engaging, of course, um, with our partners and our key stakeholders across Scotland in, in developing that strategic plan, because we really are committed to making sure that the future of work is at, at the front and centre, making sure that we're at the front and centre of public service delivery. OK, thank you very much. Thank you, Camille. Uh, thank you. I just have time to bring Maggie Chapman in for a question. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, convener. Thank you to the panel for, for all of your contributions so far this morning. We've covered a, a wide range of issues. And I, I just want to pick up on, on a couple of things. And maybe it follows on, actually, from uh, some of Michelle uh, Thompson's questioning. 
We, we've talked about how a labour shortage is not the same as a skills shortage, and we've talked about some of the, the analysis around that, around house prices, uh, rural versus urban splits, th th those kinds of things. Um, in th th there's been the discussion around T-shaped versus I-shaped uh, employees and, and, and how we support and how we, we generate that, that kind of approach. Um, there's this discussion, and quite a few of you have used the used the phrase. You know, we need we need to adopt a new mindset, and that goes for employers as well as employees. And I suppose my my question is: quite a lot of the responses that we've we've heard focus on what is it that we need to do to get the right skills training and uh, the, the right training, the right skills development, the right infrastructure in place. Um, what we haven't heard so much about is the cultural aspect, because employers and employees are people. And I'm wondering what what research has been done or what, what analysis you have got that allows us to better understand um, how, how we actually, uh, you know, how we take people with us on this. We can't just say you need to adopt a new mindset here. It, it, we, we, need, we need work around how we do that. And from that information, if, if you have anything in that space, what is it that the Scottish Parliament or the Scottish Government needs to be prioritising in, in how we look at this, I suppose particularly around the, the, the clear economic and, I would argue, moral drivers for having a, a diverse workforce that, that acknowledges that, that the breadth of experience and skills that, that we, we, we can bring to, to our economy. Uh, and I don't know, maybe to start start off with um, uh, Chris, and then I'd be interested to hear from Mary as well. Thanks. And it's a, it's a it's a great series of questions. There's there's quite a long, lot in there, so I will pick on a couple of aspects of it and allow uh, colleagues to kind of pick up that that notion of the mindset needing to be a cultural shift is really really important for individuals and. Um, I, I think for a long time, almost since our inception in SDS, we've been talking about the need for people to develop um, a set of skills from an early age that allows them, that supports them to navigate and adapt to a changing labour market. Um, we've just recently uh, embarked at the request of the Scottish Government on a review of our career service and the support that it offers. I would hasten to add it's not because um, it's broken, it's highly recognised as a a very valuable service. Our challenge is how can we make it even uh, stronger? We're focusing on how we can deliver careers, skills, um, not just to those uh, young people making the transition into the labour market, but to um, people who are, all, who are in work and who may be looking at career change. Um, so that careers review will come out with its recommendations at the end uh, of this year. It's looking at issues we've heard lots about this morning. How do you embed that culture within mm -hmm. Uh, individuals from you know 16 through to 60, how do you ensure that they've got access to advice that helps them navigate the labour market? How do we ensure that they've got access to training for upskilling and reskilling? So, um, a long-winded way of agreeing with the premise of your question. Thank you, Mary. Do you want to come in? Yeah, I mean, I think. Um the the kind of the mindset shift and the, the impact of on productivity of things like management practice um and the sort of softer side of things um you know you know there's been quite a lot of research done on the importance of that now and there's more and more focusing on that rather than just the more traditional measures that we look at to try and judge whether um, we're making progress on the drivers of productivity so it is really important the kind of um the mindset and the focus on the things that actually make a difference Part of this as well is about um, having the data and understanding of what does make a difference, you know, what works um, and achieving the outcomes that we're looking to achieve. So, I mean, Nora can maybe chat a bit more about this mm -hmm. on the sorts of research that um, this, the, the Enterprise and Skills Strategic Board have commissioned on trying yeah. to understand what different um, interventions in, in a young person's life um, and maybe the, the qualifications they achieve or whatever, what sort of wage premia they give you and what impact that, that can have on your whole life. So I think the evidence and evaluation of policy interventions is really important and has to be invested in. Um, and it might not give us answers straight away because obviously in terms of the impact that an intervention has on someone's life, it's, it's, yeah. it's by definition going to take a while to get those answers. But investment in data 
um, appraisal and evaluation of policy um, across the whole system is really important so we understand what actually works and what most efficiently, I suppose, achieves the outcomes that we're looking to achieve. Okay, thank you. Nora. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Um, and a, a really good question on culture change. And um, by a really good question, that's usually my code for I really don't have an answer for that. So here's my sort of um, my personal take on it. Culture change. I would give an example of uh, women on boards. So uh, women on boards, um, as we know, hugely um, underrepresented. Um, it was not um, mandatory. Industry had to take this on as a voluntary, um, a, a voluntary adoption, if you like, that they would uh, have more women represented on boards, particularly amongst FTSE 100 countries uh, or FTSE 250 companies. Um, so it has improved. Has it improved enough? No. So the debate still remains: is self-regulation enough? And if you don't um, reach those targets. And then should targets be set and should they be mandated? So my, the jury is still out on that, obviously, but it still impacts on what you said about um, a culture change. In terms of the enterprise and skills system, um, within SOCI, for example, um, it is now a condition of um, anyone who obtains business support, business grants, that they will have fair work and a commitment to fair work written into it. And also, for those companies that are in specific sectors or larger or are able, that they will provide mentoring um, a, to other companies um, who are trying to grow or who are in their supply chain. So that there is um, it, hopefully by adding in that conditionality that it then sets um, a precedent for that type of adoption of you know, fair work and mentoring practices that then becomes business as usual rather than being said as something mm. which is, is a condition. So culture change um, you know, has to be said, you know, coming it has, there has to be leadership shown, but there are, I think there also has to be a bit of, you know, um, carrot and stick and which follows which. But you know, a really good question, and um, you know, if you if you have a, a solution to culture change, I would love to hear it. <laughs> thank, thank you, Maggie Thanks. Chapman. I'm just going to bring uh, Colin Smith in for a brief question before we close the session. Can I just briefly follow up on a point that, that, that Nora Senior made there? Um, you referred to the fact that South Scotland Enterprise Agency now have that conditionality around fair work. So why is that not rolled out across Scottish Enterprise, Highlands and Islands Enterprise? Because in some ways you've kind of got a competitive disadvantage and not a level playing field that one agency is doing one thing but the rest are not doing the same. We do have the agencies in front of us yeah. next week but if, if Nora does want to comment on that she's welcome to come in. Sorry I was just waiting to be unmuted. Um, sorry yes I should have said um, because SOCI, SOCI is leading on it and actually they wanted to get the um, a, they, I suppose they were the pilot for what times of what, what type of words do we use? What does business understand about fair work? How you define it? So actually, they've been just... used as the guinea pig, if you like, to um, look at best practice, and then it will be rolled out across uh, the other enterprise agencies. I'm sure that's an issue we'll just, uh, come back to next week. But I'd like to thank the panel very much for their contributions this morning. It's been very valuable to hear uh, your views on the skills and employment employability agenda. So thank you. Um, I'll now bring this part of the meeting to an end and we'll move into private session. <laughs>